Welcome to Books with Noah, a podcast where I talk with my friends about their favorite books. Today joining me on Books with Noah is Javier. Javier is a good friend and a voracious reader. Welcome to Books with Noah. Hey, Noah. Good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Today we are talking about Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, which is a classic, you know, been out for decades. And I think he passed away in the 90s. But this, for people who've never heard of it, right, it's a, it's a book about this German psychiatrist, or is he Austrian, um, who ends up in the concentration camps in World War II and writes a memoir. And uh, it's a memoir, and it's not so much memoir, it's more about what he realizes about the existence in the camp and what what lessons he can take away about life in general. Would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You know, I think uh, that brings up an interesting point. You know, um, Ad, like two of Adler's four questions for the active reader are, what is this person saying and how is he saying it, right? And I think what he's saying is, is what, something that you said, which is, you know, man is driven by meaning more so than he is, you know, to more than seeking pleasure or avoiding pain or or wanting power, et cetera. Once you kind of have the basic stuff, what you really look for is meaning. And if you don't have it, then things can get pretty sad. Um, the way he's saying it uh, is really interesting. Um, so Albert Camus had this thing in his notebooks where he said, uh, you know, people think in images. And if you want to be a philosopher, write a novel. Um, I think what's like really powerful about Frankel's story, which, you know, it doesn't need to be a novel because it doesn't need to be fictionized because the drama is all there, like it grips the reader. And uh, he's living through, um, you know, some of the most extreme, harsh conditions that any man has ever lived through. It's like the furnace of suffering. And through it, he is able to, uh, you know, compose something beautiful and help so many people. Um, and, you know, we'll get into all that. But yeah, definitely agree with, uh, with what you said. Right. And he makes a good point. Um, saying there have already been books written about what it's like to, mm -hmm. to live in a concentration camp. That's not the purpose of this book. And, and you, you touched on uh, Nietzsche a little bit there and he, uh, with utilitarianism, which is, you know, the idea that, uh, which I think Nietzsche strongly rejects that the purpose of life is just to maximize pleasure and reduce pain. And um, I think Viktor Frankl and a lot of the, mm -hmm. the, German Jews at the time liked Nietzsche a lot. Um, I think they maybe identified with him, and and so yeah, you you, you had mentioned that. So um, so what was so when did you first read the book, and what kind of stuck with you? I imagine you've read it more than once. Yeah, um, you know, I, more so. I don't remember exactly when it was. I just remember that it was the wrong time. Um, you know, the first time I was introduced to it, I was maybe you know, too happily distracted with other stuff, you know, like sports and kissing my girlfriend. Um, and I just wasn't, you know, in search of meaning, um, maybe in a good way, maybe in a bad way. But uh, eventually, you know, life takes its course and you do kind of circle back to it. It's, it's a very, like you said, classic book. Um, and yes, you know, the second time around and the third and fourth, um, I revisited. What about you? When was the first time that, that you came across it? Yeah, I've read it twice, once recently, and then once um, about five years ago in California. And um, I think that's, that's, you touched on something that is kind of the core purpose of this podcast is to try to help people find a book that is appropriate for them at the, the moment. Uh, so, you know, the status of a book and you and the fit there is, is dynamic and can change over time. And mm -hmm. I, I was amazed how much more I got out of it the second time being you know, five years older and a little bit more mature, hopefully. Um, and is, I mean, it's a, I mean, cause from a, a 21st century perspective, right. I, I don't know too much about your background, but I think we're pretty privileged, right? We don't, we don't have any real struggles. We have plenty, you know, we work, we have plenty of food and whatever. Um, there aren't, there aren't any of these, you know, crazy situations like being in, you know, the ghetto or in, you know, Solzhenitsyn's, you know, gulag or, you know, we don't, we're not dealing with, you know, being deloused and vermin and, you know, potentially being killed, right? So from from such a place of, of 
of privilege, it's kind of, you're like, what could I get out of something like this? And, and you realize oh, you actually have it, you know, upside down in a lot of ways, you know, these people who were suffering in the camps had, you know, maybe the smallest pleasure, right? Like maybe, you know, one day they were somehow able to stay indoors and not have to work. And, you know, the amount of pleasure that brought them was incredible. And maybe they have, you know, family and manuscripts that they're working on and projects and, Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like it was just amazingly applicable despite having been from such a different place, right? Totally, totally. Um, yeah, there's this, there's this awesome book. It's called The Novel Cure. And it does basically uh, uh, same kind of thinking as, as what you mentioned, the purpose of the podcast was which like, what's your ailment and like what book can maybe help? And, you know, for this one, it's definitely like uh, maybe the beginning of like an existential crisis or maybe you're just going through something really, really hard and you kind of need a companion in, in the suffering. But yeah i mean i the first time either the first or the second I, you know I, you close the book and you're like okay life i'm ready i agreed with that challenge me and then you know you're brushing your teeth and thinking that your shirt looks stupid and you know you're not in these like very heightened drama um test type scenarios um but i think you, you know one of my favorite things that he says it, it's towards the end i think but he says you know um to ask like what the meaning of life is, uh, is, is too big of a question, right? Like, and it's too dynamic of a question. Um, you know, I think his analogy was that if you asked a chess player, what's the best move at the beginning? It's like, it makes no sense, right? It, it's all, what, what is it? It's like context specific. So, you know, to your point, um, depending on what you're going through, you know, he offers a few different um, sources of meaning. And he also kind of makes it explicit that, you know, um, it's not so much that you find your meaning and there it is and it's it's fixed like a diploma that you carry on for like the rest of your life but it's more so something that's maybe inside you and you can find it at certain times like kind of like islands or moments meaningful moments um or islands of meaning rather than uh yeah like this permanent state that you're in um yeah i don't know right and it consistently comes back to you know family or a passion or a spouse right this kind of yeah his his things were i think you know the three that i remember were meaningful work right so creation of something significant um he talks a lot and his is love right connection something you know significance of, of another and then you know what he kind of calls honorable suffering which is if you don't have you know the chance to create anything and maybe there's no one around whatever um and everything is completely miserable you know kind of like his experience in the camps then there's still a way to like attach meaning to your own suffering. Um, and, you know, case in point, he, he uses his experience and his uh, career in psychiatry to kind of bring together this uh, logotherapy idea. Right. And, um, you know, produces a wonderful work out of the suffering. So he kind of, you know, um, he offers a, a, a way out of that problem or a way to defeat the problem of, uh, you know, useless suffering. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's just strikes me as similar to social needs in, uh, because it, I think in, in America, especially in 21st century, you know, suffering is pretty taboo. You know, you're, you're not supposed to suffer. If you do suffer, um, you know, you try not to let other people see it because they're just going to want to run away from you. And, and social needs in says the same, says a very similar thing. Well, he actually said, and we mentioned this in, um, our interview on the Gulag Archipelago, that the problem with the U.S. is there's not enough suffering. You know, you guys can't really appreciate mm-hmm. stuff because you haven't suffered. I mean, I'm inclined to think he's right. But, um, yeah, Viktor Frankl says, you know, suffering can be noble and meaningful and can, you know, drive you to to, to something meaningful. Yeah, uh, you know, just to uh, offer another perspective, um, I totally agree. And, you know, if you, if you're at a party, you get asked... Uh, you know, how are you doing? And you told them, look, I'm, I'm breaking down, right? Like I'm in the worst heartbreak of my life. I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. People are going to like run away from you. Right. Um, but at the same time, if you're, if you say, look, I'm in the best place I've ever been every day, I, I experience new peaks of happiness. Uh, you know, I'm super fit. They're also going to be, you know, like a little turned off. Um, and so I think there's also uh, a case where like, um, we're not also allowed to be happy or to find um, meaning or, or just say like, oh, my life is really mean- meaningful, right? Like it's almost like a, um, I don't know, kind of like a backhand a little bit to all the people who are struggling. Um, but I, I think, you know, what, what, what's so nice about 
the book is that he offers, like I said, um, different sources where you can look for it. Right. And, um, you know, one of my favorite passages, uh, I, I forget exactly what it was, but they're like transferring the prisoners from, you know, one camp to another. And they're all in like the little prison carriage. And there's like the German mountains in the background and there's a sunset. And he says like, uh, you know, even though you wouldn't think, um, you know, people who have given up on life and on liberty and whatever, um, we still found like everyone was like speechless and we were enjoying like that little transcendent bit of nature so much. And then he talks about like, um, you know, uh, people making jokes, you know, and there's like that common saying where like you can either cry or laugh about things. And he, he, so, you know, art uh, n- and natural beauty, um, humor. Um, and another one, it's like, it's very, very stoic in the sense where he says, you know, you can take everything away from a man except for like, his attitude to like, how he responds. Right. And he said that all basically he needed to learn was in the few examples of like people helping each other out in the camp, like that there was a guy who you know gave his you know tiny piece of bread ration to someone else or like to cheer someone else up. And that those examples, um, you know, were just enough to be able to prove that like in the worst of conditions, like conditions, um, you can still, uh, you know, choose your own way. Yeah. And just to reiterate what you just said and how you respond. You mm-hmm. said, you know, just filled with suffering, right? And yeah, the only thing you, you know, could control is what, yeah, what's upstairs. There was, um, I remember, I think it was pretty early on, but he, he was talking about like these two steps out of the room. Do you remember that part where he's like, there's these two steps and they're like six inches high. And he looked at them like with dread every day just because going up those two steps was a nightmare physically. And I don't know, it just, for me, that like really grounds you to think like, I've never ever looked at a step or, you know, I've never been in that condition. You know, I've been terribly hung over, but I've never, you know, <laughs> had like six inches of steps concern me that much. Or, I mean, he even goes to say that, you know, when you're that deprived of um, food and stuff that like you go kind of like to a lower primitive level and like your dreams are start like being wish fulfillment to like, um, food and food and, right, and food, right? Um, so it, i mean again to your point um in a first world problem you know a first world problem of wanting to find meaning maybe it's i think it's still fair right like there's there's bad stuff going off all over the world for sure um more than um you know we can even imagine but um at the same time you know i think it's fair to i don't think you have to um you're not really solving anything for anyone if, if you um if you kind of don't find a, if you if you get stuck there, you know, if you only get stuck in in thinking about just the suffering rather than you know trying to work again something useful or, or consoling or whatever um, out of it. Agreed. Did you have any thoughts on the the leaders, like the work leaders, both that were inmates and of the um, the guards? Uh, in what sense? Well, like he talks about how some of the, the, there were different kinds of guards and some of them were, at least I believe it was, yeah, Frankel, who, um, you know, just, I feel like they probably didn't have any autonomy in their own life and the way they mm. would exercise that, right, is by being harsh to to prisoners. And it's just, it's sad. And there's that part of the equation as well. Yeah, yeah. Um you know, I always think about, and uh, I don't know if it was derived from there. I always forget it, but like that Stanford prison experiment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if it was, was it based off like, if you were a concentration camp officer, like would I think you- it's similar with I, the shock experiments, there, right? Yeah, there's or, like, there's a, yeah. Was, or no, I'm getting but, confused. Yeah, the, the shock is, the, the shock is another one where, yeah, we're like, you can hear the people in pain, but yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Related. Same, same lines where like, if you're, you're put in a position to cause someone harm, um, but you're being told to, told to, right? So like you're kind of um, in fear of like maybe disobeying authority or whatever, uh, just how easily, uh, you know, manipulated you can be out of, you know, a whole range of emotions. Um, and yeah, I, it, 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 it's, it's tough, right? You, you, it is one of the most horrible things in history. Um, and yet at the same time, like, wh- wh- I think it was late nineties was the experiment. It proved it took him, you know, 48 hours to turn aggressive against their former friends or, you know, peers. 
Um, so yeah, like we're a fragile thing. And I think, again, the reason it's so helpful to read books like these or stoic philosophy or other ways of seeing um, is so that like, at least you're equipped if that situation comes where at least you know that you can choose, right? Rather than maybe having never been exposed to a conversation like this or a book like that. And uh, you kind of just do as you're told. Um, I think, you know, one of the great things about books is that they're like um, uh, simulation type stuff where you, you can live a bunch of different lives through reading and a lot like uh, go through a lot of different experiences. And, you know, this is one of them and, you know, uh, that you, you can have a taste of. And if you ever find yourself in remotely similar situation, um, you know, you can know that there's a, a wise and, you know, productive way out of something, you know, very challenging. Well said. Well, I'd like to wrap up with uh, two quotes. I don't know if you have a quote to share, if you no. um, do or not. But um, one, actually, I don't know if this is a, a direct quote, but he said sort of the end of the book, you know, people cannot pursue happiness, but must rather pursue reasons to be happy, right? Um, meaning your, whether it's your craft or your passions or your family, you know, if you're just which I think goes along with the Nietzsche um, rejection of utilitarianism of just, you know, going after pleasure will not get you there. Um, and then I, the other one is, is the actual Nietzsche quote, uh, which if he quotes verbatim, which is, you know, he who has a why to live for mm. can bear almost any how. And that's the, the theme that runs through the book. And for his whole logotherapy or logotherapy, Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love that Nietzsche quote is, 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 you know, I think it's pretty much the, the theme of the book. So I, I won't spoil that, that close with, uh, with, with something else. I think that's a great way to end. Man. Cool. Well, Javier, thank you for being part of books with Noah. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for listening to books with Noah please visit our website, bookswithnoah.com. You can also find us on YouTube by searching Books with Noah.